BestBookBits.com presents A Guide to the Good Life, The Ancient Art of Stoic Joy by William Braxton Ivan. Published back in 2008 and weighing in at 326 pages. One of the great fears many of us face is that despite all our effort and striving, we will discover at the end that we have wasted our life. In A Guide to the Good Life, William B. Ivan plums the wisdom of Stoic philosophy, one of the most popular and successful schools of thought in ancient Rome, and shows how insight and advice are still remarkably applicable to modern lives. In A Guide to the Good Life, Ivan offers a refreshing presentation of Stoicism, showing how this ancient philosophy can still direct us toward a better life. Using the psychological insights and the practical techniques of the Stoics, Ivan offers a roadmap for anyone seeking to avoid the feeling of chronic dissatisfaction that plagues so many of us. Ivan looks at various Stoic techniques for attaining tranquility, and shows us how to put these techniques to work in our own life. As he does so, he describes his own experiences practicing Stoicism and offers valuable first-hand advice for anyone wishing to live better by following in the footsteps of these ancient philosophers. Readers learn how to minimize worry, how to let go of the past and focus our efforts on the things we can control, and how to deal with insults, grief, old age, and the distracting temptations of fame and fortune. We learn from Marcus Aurelius the importance of prizing only things of true value, and from Epictetus, we learn how to be more content with what we have. The written summary can be found on our website, bestbookbits.com. So without further ado, I bring the book summary of A Guide to the Good Life. Part 1, The Rise of Stoicism. Philosophy takes an interest in life. Affiliating oneself with a school of philosophy was a serious business, according to historian Simon Price. Adherence to a philosophical sect was not simply a matter for the mind or the result of mere intellectual fashion. Those who took their philosophy seriously attempted to live that philosophy from day to day. And just as modern individual religion can become the key element of his personal identity, an ancient Greeks or Romans philosophical association became an important part of who he was. Readers of the book should keep in mind that although I am advocating Stoicism as a philosophy of life, it isn't the only option available to those seeking such a philosophy. The first Stoics, Zeno, 333-261 to BC, was the first Stoic. Zeno's father was a merchant of purple dye and used to come home from his travels with books for Zeno to read. Among them were philosophy books purchased in Athens. These books aroused Zeno's interest in both philosophy and Athens. Zeno set out to learn philosophical theory. He went off to study Stilpo of the Megarian school. He also studied Polmo at the academy and in around 300 BC, he started his own school of philosophy. In his teaching, he's appeared to have mixed the lifestyle advice of Crates with the theoretical philosophy of Polmo. Zeno's school of philosophy enjoyed immediate success. His followers were initially called Xenions, but because he was in the habit of giving his lectures in the Stoa Pokal, they subsequently became known as the Stoics as Roman Stoicism, the most important of the Roman Stoics, and the Stoics from whom I think modern individuals have most to gain were Seneca, Munsanus, Rufus, Epictetus, and Marcus Aurelius. Lucius Anonus Seneca was also known as Seneca the Younger, was born sometime between 4 and 1 BC in Corduba, Spain, although we have more of his philosophical writings than we have of any other Stoic. He wasn't the most prolific of the Stoics, nor was he particularly original. Nevertheless, his Stoic writings are quite wonderful. His essays and lectures are full of insight into the human condition. In these writings, Seneca talks about the things that typically make people unhappy, such as grief, anger, old age, and social anxieties, and about what we can do to make our life not just tolerable, but joyful. Gunus Musanus Rufus was the least well-known of the four great Roman Stoics, who was born in around 30 AD. Because of his family's standings, Munsanus could have gone into politics, but instead he started a school of philosophy. We know little about Munsunius in part because he, like Socrates, didn't bother to write down his philosophical thoughts. Fortunately, Musonius had a pupil, Lucius, who took notes during lectures. In these notes, Lucius often begins by talking about what he, Monsonius, said in response to some question. 
It therefore seems likely that the lectures Monsonius gave in the school weren't monologues, rather he carried on a two-way Socratic conversation with his students. Epictetus, the most famous of the Monsonius students, was born into slavery sometime between 50 and 60 AD. According to Epictetus, the primary concern of philosophy should be the art of living, should be the art of living, just as wood is the medium of the carpenter and bronze is the medium of the sculpture. Your life is the medium of which you practice the art of living. Begin each day by telling yourself, today I shall be meeting with interference, ingratitude, insolence, disloyalty, ill will, and selfishness, all of them due to the offender's ignorance of what is good or evil. These words were written not by a slave like Epictetus, whom we would naturally expect to encounter insolence and ill will. They were written by a person whom was at the time the most powerful man in the world, Marcus Aurelius, Emperor of Rome. As Roman emperors go, Marcus was exceptionally good. For one thing, he exercised great restraint in his use of power. No emperor, we are told, showed more respect to the Senate than Marcus did. He took care not to waste public money. Part 2. Stoic Philosophical Techniques Negative Visualization. What's the worst that can happen? Any thoughtful person will periodically contemplate the bad things that can happen to him. The obvious reason for doing this is to prevent those things from happening. But no matter how hard we try to prevent bad things from happening to us, some will happen anyway. Seneca therefore points to a second reason for contemplating the bad things that will happen to us. If we think about these things, we will lessen their impact on us when, despite our efforts at prevention, they happen. We humans are unhappy in large part because we are insatiable. After working hard to get what we want, we routinely lose interest in the object of our desire. Rather than feeling satisfied, we feel a bit bored. And in response to this boredom, we go on to form new, even grander desires. One key to happiness then is to full stale the adaptation process. We need to take steps to prevent ourselves from taking for granted once we get them, the things we work so hard to get. And because we have probably failed to take such steps in the past, there are doubtless many things in our life to which we have adapted, things that we once dreamed of having, but that now we take for granted, including perhaps our spouse, our children, our house, our car, and our job. The Stoics recommended that we spend time imagining that we have lost the things we value, that our wife has left us, our car was stolen, or we lost our job. During this, the Stoics thought, will make us value our wife, our car, and our job more than we otherwise would. This technique is, I think, the single most valuable technique in the Stoics' philo philosophical toolkit. The dichotomy of control on becoming invincible. Our most important choice in life, according to Epictetus, is whether to concern ourselves with the things external to us or the things internal. Most people choose the former because they think harms and benefits come from outside themselves. According to Epictetus, he would look for the, all the benefit and harm to come from himself. While most people seek to gain contentment by changing the world around them, Epictetus advises us to gain contentment by changing ourselves, more precisely, by changing our desires. Besides having complete control over our goals and values, Marcus points out that we have complete control over our character. We are, he says, the only ones who can stop ourselves from attaining goodness and integrity. We have it entirely within our power, for example, to prevent viciousness and cupidity from finding a home in our soul. It is obviously foolish for us to spend time and energy concerning ourselves with things outside of our control, because we have no control at all over the things in question. Any time and energy we spend will have no effect on the outcome of events and will therefore be wasted time and energy. And as Marcus observes, nothing is worth doing pointlessly. Remember that among the things over which we have complete control are the goals we set for ourselves. The goals we set for ourselves. I think that when a Stoic concerns himself with the things over which he has some but not complete control, such as winning a tennis match, he will be very careful about the goals he sets for himself. In particular, he will be careful to set internal rather than external goals. 
Thus, his goal in playing tennis will not be to win a match, something external over which he has only partial control, but to play the best of his ability in the match, something internal over which he has complete control. By choosing this goal, he will spare himself frustration or disappointment should he lose the match. Since it was not his goal to win the match, he will not have failed to attain his goal, as long as he played his best. His tranquility will not be disrupted. Fatalism, letting go of the past and the present. One way to preserve our tranquility, the Stoics thought, is to take a fatalistic attitude towards the things that will happen to us. According to Seneca, we should offer ourselves to fate, in as much as it is great consolation that it is together with the universe we are swept along. One might expect the ancient Romans to refuse to participate in life's contest. Why bother when the future has already been determined? What is interesting is that despite their determinism, despite their belief that whatever happened had to happen, the ancients were not fatalistic about the future. The Stoics, for example, did not sit around apathetically, resigned to whatever the future held in store. To the contrary, they spent their days working to affect the outcome of future events. When the Stoics advocated fatalism, they were advocating a restricted form of the doctrine. More precisely, they are advising us to be fatalistic with respect to the past, to keep firmly in mind that the past cannot be changed. In saying that we shouldn't dwell on the past, the Stoics are not suggesting that we should never think about it. We sometimes should think about the past to learn lessons that can help us in our efforts to shape the future. Notice that the advice that will be fatalistic with respect to the past and the present is consistent with the advice offered in the preceding chapter, that we not concern ourselves with things over which we have no control. We have no control over the past, nor do we have any control over the present. It is by the present we mean this very moment. Therefore, we are wasting our time if we worry about the past or present events. Self-denial on dealing with the dark side of pleasure. Besides contemplating bad things happening, we should sometimes live as though they had happened. In particular, instead of merely thinking about what it would be like to lose our wealth, we should periodically practice poverty. We should, that is, content ourselves with the scantiest and cheapest fare and with coarse and rough dress. Readers should realize, though, that the Stoics didn't go around flogging themselves. Indeed, the discomforts they inflicted upon themselves were rather minor. Furthermore, they did not inflict these discomforts to punish themselves. Rather, they did it to increase their enjoyment of life. What the Stoics were advocating then is more appropriately described as a program of voluntary discomfort than as a program of self-inflicted discomfort. A person who periodically experiences minor discomfort will grow confident that he can withstand major discomforts as well. So as the prospect of experiencing such discomforts at some future time will not at present be a source of anxiety for him. Another benefit of undertaking acts of voluntary discomfort is that it helps us to appreciate what we already have. It is of course nice to be in a warm room when it is cold and blustery outside. But if we really want to enjoy the warmth and sense of shelter, we should go outside in the cold for a while, then come back in. Besides periodically engaging in acts of voluntary discomfort, we should, say the Stoics, periodically forego opportunities to experience pleasure. We might, for example, make a point of passing up an opportunity to drink wine. Not because we fear becoming an alcoholic, but we can also learn to self-control. For the Stoics, and indeed for anyone attempting to practice a philosophy of life, self-control will be an important trait to acquire. Meditation, watching ourselves practice Stoicism. To help us advance our practice of Stoicism, Seneca advises that we periodically meditate on the events of daily living, how we respond to these events, and how, in accordance with Stoic principles, we should have responded to them. He attributes this technique to his teacher, Sextatus, who at a bedtime would ask himself, what element of yours have you cured today? What failings have you resisted? Where can you show improvement? Something else we can do during our Stoic meditations is judge our progress as Stoics. There are several indicators by which we can measure this progress. For one thing, as Stoicism takes hold of us, we will notice that our relations with other people have changed. 
We will discover, says Epictetus, that our feelings aren't hurt when others tell us that we know nothing or that we are mindfulness fools about things external to us. We will shrug off their insults and slights. We will also shrug off any praise they might direct our way. Indeed, Epictetus thinks the admiration of other people is a negative barometer of our progress as Stoics. If people think you amount to something, distrust yourself. Other signs of progress, says Epictetus, are the following. We will stop blaming, censoring and praising ourselves. We will stop boasting about ourselves and how much we know. And we will blame ourselves, not external circumstances, when our desires are thwarted. And because we have gained a degree of mastery over our desires, we will find that we have fewer of them than we did before. We will find, Epictetus says, that our impulses towards everything are diminished. The most important sign that we are making progress as Stoics, though it is a change in our emotional life, we will find ourselves experience fewer negative emotions. We will also find that we are spending less time than we used to, to wishing things could be different and more time enjoying things as they were. We will find that we are experiencing to a degree of tranquility that our life previously lacked. Part 3. Stoic Advice Duty on Loving Mankind On examining our life, we will find that other people are the source of some of the great delights life has to offer, including love and friendship. But we also discover that they are the cause of most of the negative emotions we experience. Because the Stoics value tranquility, and because they appreciated that the power other people have to disrupt our tranquility, we might expect them to have lived as hermits and advise us to do the same. But the Stoics did no such thing. They thought that man is by nature a social animal, and therefore we have the duty to form and maintain relationships with other people, despite their trouble they might cause us. If we do the things we were made for, says Marcus, we will enjoy a man's true delight. But an important part of our function, as we have seen, is to work with and for our fellow men. Marcus therefore concludes that doing his social duty will give him the best chance at having a good life. This for Marcus is the reward for doing one's duty, a good life. Social relations on dealing with other people. To begin with, the Stoics recommend that we prepare for our dealings with other people before we have to deal with them. Thus, Epictetus advises us to form a certain character and pattern for ourselves when we are alone. Then, when we associate with other people, we should remain true to who we are. Besides advising us to avoid people with vices, Seneca advises us to avoid people who are simply whiny, who are melancholy and bewail everything who find pleasure in every opportunity for complaint. He justifies this avoidance by observing that a companion who is always upset and bemoans everything is a foe to tranquility. When we find ourselves irritated by someone's shortcomings, we should pause to reflect on our own shortcomings. Doing this will help us become more empathetic to this individual's faults and therefore become more tolerant of him. Insults on putting up with put-downs. When dealing with insults, one strategy is to pause, when insulted, to consider whether that the insulter said it is true. If it is, there is little reason to be upset. Suppose, for example, that someone mocks us for being bold when we are in fact are bold. Why is it an insult, Seneca asks, to be told what is self-evident? Another strategy is to consider the source of an insult. If I respect the source, if I value his opinions, then his critical remarks shouldn't upset me. So how should you deal with insults? By laughing off an insult. We are implying that we don't take the insulter and his insults seriously. To imply this, of course, is to insult the insulter without directly doing so. It is therefore a response that it is likely to deeply frustrate the insulter. Refusing to respond to an insult is, paradoxically, one of the most effective responses possible. For one thing, as Seneca points out, our non-response can be quite disconcerting for the insulter, who will wonder whether or not we understood his insult. Furthermore, we are robbing him of the pleasure of having upset us, and he is likely to be upset as a result. Grief on vanishing tears with reason. Although it might not be possible to eliminate grief from our life, it is possible, Seneca thinks, to take steps to minimize the amount of grief we experience over the course of a lifetime. The Stoics' primary grief prevention strategy was to engage in negative visualization. 
By contemplating the deaths of those we love, we remove some of the shock we experience if they die. We will, in a sense, have seen it coming. In normal perspective negative visualization, we imagine losing something we currently possess. In retrospective negative visualization, we imagine never having had something we have lost. By engaging in retrospective negative visualization, Seneca thinks we can replace our feelings of regret at having lost something with the feelings of thanks for once having had it. Anger and overcoming anti-joy. Seneca offers lots of specific advice on how to prevent anger. We should, he says, fight our tendency to believe the worst about others and our tendency to jump to conclusions about their motivations. We need to keep in mind that just because things don't turn out the way we wanted them to, it doesn't follow that someone has done us an injustice. In particular, says Seneca, we need to remember that in some cases, the person at whom we are angry in fact helped us. In such cases, what angers us is that he didn't help us even more. To avoid becoming angry, say Seneca, we should also keep in mind that the things that anger us generally don't do us any real harm. They are instead mere annoyances. By allowing ourselves to get angry over little things, we take what might have been a barely noticeable disruption of our day and transform it into a tranquility-shattering state of agitation. Marcus also offers advice on anger avoidance. He recommends, as we have seen, that we contemplate the in permanence of the world around us. If we do this, he says, we will realize that many of the things we think are important, in fact, aren't. At least not in the grand scheme of things. When angry, says Seneca, we should take steps to turn all anger's indicators into their opposites. We should force ourselves to relax our face, soften our voice, and slow our pace of walking. If we do this, our internal state will soon come to the resemble our external state, and our anger, say Seneca, will have dissipated. Personal Values on Seeking Fame Epictetus advises us not to seek social status, since if we make it our goal to please others, we will no longer be free to please ourselves. We will, he says, have enslaved ourselves. If we wish to retain our freedom, says Epictetus, we must be careful while dealing with other people to be indifferent to what they think of us. One way to overcome the obsession of caring what people think is to realize that in order to win the admiration of other people, we will have to adopt their values. More precisely, we will have to live a life that is successful according to their notion of success. Consequently, before we try to win the admiration of these other people, we should stop to ask whether their notion of success is compatible with ours. Personal Values on luxurious living. Seneca says it is a folly to think that it is the amount of money and not the state of mind that matters. Mursanus agrees with this assessment. Possessing wealth, he observes, won't enable us to live without sorrow and won't console us in our old age. And although wealth can procure for us physical luxuries and various pleasures of the senses, it can never bring us contentment or banish our grief. There is indeed a danger that if we are exposed to a luxurious lifestyle, we will lose our ability to take delight in simple things. When people become hard to please, a curious thing happens. Rather than moaning the loss of their ability to enjoy simple things, they take pride in their newly gained inability to enjoy anything but the best. The Stoics, however, would pity these individuals. They would point out that by undermining their ability to enjoy simple things, these individuals had seriously impaired their ability to enjoy life. The Stoics work hard to avoid falling victim to this kind of connoisseurship. Indeed, the Stoics value highly their ability to enjoy ordinary life, and indeed, their ability to find sources of delight even when living in primitive conditions. How much wealth should we acquire? According to Seneca, our financial goal should be to acquire an amount that does not descend to poverty, and yet is not far removed from poverty. We should, he says, learn to restrain luxury, cultivate frugality, and view poverty with unprejudiced eyes. The lifestyle of a Stoic, he adds, should be somewhere in between that of a sage and that of an ordinary person. Exile on surviving a change of place. To endure and even thrive in exile, 
Musonis says a person must keep in mind that his happiness depends more on his values than on where he resides. Even though readers of this book are unlikely to be exiled by their government, they run a considerable risk if current social trends continue on being exiled by their children. Exiled, that is, to a nursing home. It is a transition that, if they let it, can severely disrupt their tranquility. Old age, on being banished to a nursing home. Old age, Seneca argues, has its benefits. Let us cherish and love old age, for it is full of pleasure if one knows how to use it. Indeed, he claims that the most delight time of life is when it is on our downward slope, but has not yet reached the abrupt decline. The proximity of death, rather than depressing us, can be turned to an advantage. In our youth, because we assumed that we would never live forever, we took our days for granted, and as a result, wasted many of them. In our old age, however, waking up each morning can be a cause for celebration. As Seneca notes, if God is pleased to add another day, we should welcome it with glad hearts. And after celebrating, having been given another day to live, we can fill that day with appreciating living. Dying, on a good end to a good life. Those who have lived without coherent philosophy of life, though will just partly want to delay death. They might want to delay so that they can get the thing that at last they have discovered to be of value. It is unfortunate that it is dawned on them so late in life. But as Seneca observes, what you have done in the past will be manifest only at the time when you draw your last breath. When Stoics contemplate their own death, it is not because they long for death, but because they want to get the most out of life. As we have seen, someone who thinks he will live forever is far more likely to waste his days than someone who fully understands that his days are numbered. And one way to gain this understanding is periodically to contemplate his own death. On becoming a Stoic, start now and prepare to be mocked. The most important reason for adopting a philosophy of life is that if we lack one, there is a danger that we will mislive. That we will spend our life pursuing goals that aren't worth attaining or will pursue worthless goals in a foolish manner and we will therefore fail to attain them. What will be our reward for practicing Stoicism? According to the Stoics, we can hope to become more virtuous. And in the ancient sense of the word, we will always, they say, experience fewer negative emotions such as anger, grief, disappointment, and anxiety. And because this, we will enjoy a degree of tranquility that previously would be unattainable. Along with avoiding negative emotions, we will increase our chances of experiencing one particularly significant positive emotion, delight in the world around us. Part 4. Stoicism for Modern Lives The Decline of Stoicism Stoicism was also undermined by the rise of Christianity, in part because the claims made by Christianity were similar to those made by Stoicism. The Stoics claim, for example, that the gods created man, care about man's well-being, and gave him a divine element, the ability to reason. The Christians claim that God created man, cares about him in a very personal way, and gave him a divine element, a soul. And Marcus's advice that we love mankind was certainly echoed in Christianity. Because of these similarities, Stoics and Christians found themselves competing for the same potential adherence. In this competition, however, Christianity had one big advantage over Stoicism. It promised not just life after death, but an afterlife in which one would infinitely satisfied for eternity. The Stoics, on the other hand, thought it was possible that there was life after death, but were not certain of it. And if there was indeed life after death, the Stoics were uncertain what it would be like. Stoicism reconsidered. On evolutionary ancestors who had reasoning ability were more likely to survive and reproduce than those who didn't. It is also important to realize that we did not gain the ability to reason so that we could transcend our evolutionary program desires such as the desires for sex and social status. To the contrary, we gain the ability to reason so that we could more effectively satisfy those desires, so that we could, for example, devise complex strategies by which to satisfy our desire for sex and social status. We have the abilities we do because possessing them enable our evolutionary ancestors to survive and reproduce. 
From this, it does not follow though, that we must use these abilities to survive and reproduce. Indeed, thanks to our reasoning ability, we have it in our power to misuse our evolutionary inheritance, e.g. using your sense of hearing to enjoy music instead of to avoid danger. Although our evolutionary programming helped us flourish as a species, it has in many respects outlived its usefulness. If our goal is not merely to survive and reproduce, but to enjoy a tranquil existence, the pain associated with a loss of social status isn't just useless, it is counterproductive. As we go about our daily affairs, other people, because of their evolutionary programming, will work, often unconsciously, to gain social status. As a result, they will be inclined to snub us, insult us, or more generally, do things to put us in our place, socially speaking. Their actions can have the effect of disrupting our tranquility if we let them. What we must do in these cases is use, more precisely, misuse our intellect to override the evolutionary programming that makes insults painful to us. We must, in other words, use our reasoning, ability to remove the emotional sting of insults and thereby make them less disruptive to our tranquility. Practicing Stoicism the first tip I would offer to those wishing to give Stoicism a try is to practice what I have referred to as Stealth Stoicism. You would do well, I think, to keep it a secret that you are a practicing Stoic. By practicing Stoicism stealthily, you can gain its benefits while avoiding one significant cost, the teasing and outright mockery of your friends, relatives, neighbors, and co-workers. My next piece of advice is not to try to master all the stoic techniques at once, but to start with one technique, and having become proficient in it, go on to another. Practicing stoicism doesn't take much effort. Indeed, it takes far less effort than the effort one is likely to waste in the absence of a philosophy of life. One can practice stoicism without being any the wiser, and one can practice it for a time, and then abandon it, and no worse off for the attempt. There is, in other words, little to lose by giving Stoicism a try as one's philosophy to life, and there is potentially much to gain. And that's a wrap on A Guide to the Good Life by William B. Ivan. Subscribe to our channel to take a look at the hundreds of book summaries uploaded previously. To find hundreds of written book summaries, check out our website, bestbookbits.com, and for hundreds of audio podcast summaries, find us on mixcloud.com forward slash bestbookbits. Like and share if you got something from this summary and comment on what one thing stood out for you. Thanks for watching and have yourself an amazing day.